I Hate Politics is a podcast dedicated to exploring a human activity we love to hate. We look at human life, culture, economics closest to us in our neighborhoods, workplaces, schools and streets, and in our local governments. Together, we'll explore how politics is central to getting things done in societies where we treasure diverse views and preferences. I'm Sunil Dasgupta. I've spent my life studying politics, and I know this. Unless we want to live in a dictatorship or a monarchy, we are stuck with politics. Politics is more than just Trump, Biden, or elections. It's how we fix potholes, make our streets safer, where we put our schools, and decide who goes to them. It's about coming together as a community. It's about us. Let's go find those stories. Last week was a horrific reminder that Asian Americans are not the model minority. Six women of Asian descent were killed in a suburb of Atlanta. The killings which occurred in three health spas showed plainly the working class reality of many Asian immigrants to the United States. Contrary to the perception that all Asians were rich, super educated, and could be categorized together with whites for most public policy analysis. Certainly in Montgomery County, the public school system views whites and Asians on one side of the policy issues, and blacks and Latinos on the other side. The origins of the term BIPOC black and indigenous people of color, was a term designed to bring narrow focus on those communities by qualifying the larger category, people of color, which included Asians. Where during the civil rights era, Asian Americans had marched with African American groups as allies, events like the Los Angeles riots in 1992 caused ruptures in the alliance. The problem of allyship in the social justice movement today includes whites and Asians. As I wondered about this question, I asked Ariani Ong, a Montgomery County Asian American activist and civil rights attorney, to dwell on where the Asian American identity comes from. Ariani recently formed a new organization called Montgomery County Progressive Asian American Network, highlighting the importance of that allyship. The Atlanta killings set on fire a community that was put on edge by the China virus rhetoric of the former president, where in a year, Asian American groups used to report a few hundred incidents of harassment, abuse, and outright violence. The number since last March is 3,800, 164 of them in the Washington, D.C. region. At a memorial service in Montgomery County, Tingming Chao a local Chinese leader laid out the anxiety that Asian Americans feel. On one side, we are more than minorities. We have scientists helping at all aspects in the front line of COVID-19. On the other side, we are foreigners seeming to be too foreign to be integrated. On one hand, we are told this year is not 1882 with the Chinese Exclusion Act. On the other hand, we hear vividly, you don't belong here. On one hand, America is the sky, is the limit. But on the other hand, there are less and less room and opportunity for people that are different and unique. Finally, on one hand, we're living in a great country that affords all who live here the right to be treated equally. But on the other hand, we fear for ourselves. We worry about negative perceptions, and we feel the sorrow and angst that comes with those concerns. Now, the news roundup. First, some Virginia news. Virginia became the first southern state to abolish the death penalty. Separately, Governor Ralph Northam ordered state agencies to stop using single-use plastics. The Montgomery County Council appropriated half a million dollars to fund the creation of a new housing production fund. The county's Housing Opportunities Commission can now issue $50 million 
dollars in bonds for financing construction of mixed income development projects. This is the county's experiment in social housing. The HOC, the Housing Opportunities Commission, estimates that it can create about 8,800 new units because of this money. It is worth asking if a similar model of financing is possible to enable the investments necessary to bring to fruition the county's Green New Deal ambitions. MCPS, for example, has entered into a contract to lease over 300 electric buses as a first step toward an energy use overhaul. There are several public-private partnership models that could help MCPS put solar panels on building roofs, but they require long-term energy management contracts. If there was a possibility that a county energy opportunities commission, like the Housing Opportunities Commission, could issue bonds, this might be an opportunity for the county to pull in some really low-interest, long-term financing to enable its crossover to a cleaner future. We'll be addressing climate change in an episode slated for release around Earth Day, April 22nd. It seems that there is more clarity now on County Executive Elrich's proposal to remove SROs from school. And there is more than meets the eye. We are now accepting voice letters. Listener Mike English and our guest from the SRO episode, Lauren Payne, had their say. First, Mike. While County Executive Elrich continues to develop the details of his SRO proposal, as of the time of this recording, all publicly available documents, testimonies, and other information indicate that SROs will still exist under his program and simply be removed from individual schools and instead patrol between and around schools. While this is certainly an improvement over the status quo, it does not go as far as Bill 4620, which is sponsored by Councilmembers Jawando, Reamer, and Hucker, and supported by Councilmember Glass. That bill would end the SRO program and prohibit the use of all SROs. So while I think the county executive deserves some credit for his proposal, I essentially consider it to be SRO light, not the end of the SRO program, as would be the case with 4620, and I felt that the otherwise excellent episode sometimes conflated the two. Hi, this is Lauren Payne, MCPS student, high schooler, high school senior at Richmond Montgomery High School, working on the SRO issue. I was on the I Hate Politics podcast about a week or so ago discussing the SRO issue. Um, some recent developments have been made. The county executive, Mark Elridge, put out his budget proposal, um, clearly stating that he wants to remove SROs. However, some new developments have been made where they want to replace the current program with CROs. Um, and this program is simply the SRO program part two. Um, it's not a win for us. It's frankly making steps backward and looks like we still have some advocacy to continue to do. Um, it looks like the fight is not over yet. CRO stands for Community Resource Officer, yet another euphemism. The politics of euphemism is what so often makes ordinary folks come to hate politics. We'll be following the CRO-SRO issue closely. I will be back with Ariane. Ariane Young, welcome to I Hate Politics. Thank you for having me here, Sunil. You've been talking about hate incidents with respect to Asian Americans for some time now. And of course, now we have the killings um, outside of Atlanta. Can you please lay out some of your primary concerns that have been building for some time? In comparison to what I was tracking, which is about three to 500 incidents per year, there's a group of organizations in California um, which comprise Stop API Hate, an online tracker, they were receiving 100 incidents per day. So it was an indication of, of the um, immediate and swift and broad impact on the Asian American community um, who were seen as foreigners carrying this disease from Asia um, in a very familiar pattern of racializing disease. So in the past year, incidents per day has leveled off, but in total, it's 3,800 incidents to date that has been documented. And this is the figure that's vastly under reported. 
And according to um, Asian American Justice Center, 164 of those are in the DMV area. But the, the larger issue really is the hostile environment, which has allowed for these incidents to breed and to um, rear their, their ugly heads. There's been you know, very concerning incidents that have occurred that where bias motive has not been established, but really has uh, catalyzed the Asian American community with rightful concern because they've dealt with the targeting of the most vulnerable among us, senior citizens, um, you know, who have been attacked, who have fallen over, been in comas, died, had their eyes gouged out, had, you know, their face slashed across, you know, with a knife. Um, and then also a rash of, of, of robberies and vandalism against Asian owned businesses. So let me ask you, how are these incidents reported? How do you, what is the reporting system? Do you know? So there, there are two systems, broadly speaking. And one is through the community. Um, targets generally tend to trust more community-based organizations of which there are very few mm -hmm. um, to begin with and much less those who actually do collect this kind of hate crime data. So it gets reported to them if it gets reported at all. And then the, the other portal is the law enforcement agencies through the non-emergency number. Um, and, and generally the, you know, the incidents get reported to those two sources, but of course there's other different entry points. So like in Montgomery County, there's the Asian American Liaison's Office, the Office of Community Partnerships, there's the Human Rights Commission, mm -hmm. you know, there's the state attorney general has a hate crimes task force hotline. So there are many ways to report, but generally they, they go either to community or law enforcement. And the Asian American Justice Center puts all these different sources together to combine uh, and develop these um, listings? So the, the challenge is that there's not one central reporting site. Mm -hmm. Asian American Justice Center, which is where I worked 20 years ago, was one of the earliest to collect that hate crime data, but since there's been half a dozen other organizations that, you know, also do. And, and the coalition that I mentioned out in California, which is Stop API Hate, um, it's a coalition of three organizations. Mm -hmm. They actually document now 80% of the COVID related um, anti-Asian incidents, but you okay. can report to Asian American Justice Center. You can report to OCA Asian Pacific American Advocates. You can report to South Asian Americans leading tomorrow or Muslim advocates right. or the lawyers committee on um, civil rights under law. So there are many places to report. Okay. Um, so when this 3,800 uh, incidents and 164 in the DMV area, they're worrisome, uh, would you be able to break them down into t incident types? What kinds of incidents are we seeing? So the majority majority of the hate incidents are clustered around cities where there are high Asian American populations, mm -hmm. and you know of those, you know the the majority of the um, incidents are those incidents that don't rise to a prosecutable crime. So either like verbal harassment, shunning, you know, um, to other physical assaults. It could be spitting to pushing to um, you know, again, knifing assaults, which mm -hmm. happened to a Burmese American family in, in Midland, Texas, with a two year old and six year old. Mm -hmm. um, it, it also includes uh, workplace discrimination, but most of it is verbal harassment. Uh, but there are also a significant number of physical assaults, which have been very violent. And that's where a lot of the concern is swirling as a broad impact on people who don't want to even leave their homes now. Do you find law enforcement and state's attorneys and others, uh, prosecutors standing up and uh, in support of the community? So this varies across the country. There are jurisdictions like ours in Montgomery County. I'm very proud of our county. They reached out to us first, mm. you know, in support and held a unity conference this past Friday. And the police chief was there. And we've had public safety town hall meetings even before this. Um, after COVID-19, um, when they heard about 
the concerns within the community. Um, and there are others like say in Wisconsin where you know the governor and mayor has said nothing. Asia is not a small place. It goes from Japan all the way to Middle East. But in the United States, immigrants from all over Asia get put together in one category. So where does this singular notion of Asian American come from? Until around 1987, mm-hmm. I lived in Houston, Texas. Mm-hmm. And at that time, we were still broadly known as Orientals. You know, I did not see Asian American faces on TV until about 1982, at least. It's around that time where I, you know, I don't, I didn't, I was not aware that there was a political identity that had been established back in the 60s, you know, in Berkeley with the third world strike, you know, when Mm -hmm. students um, organized in order to have ethnic studies. Um, curriculums adopted by the universities. In 1982, there was a hate crime murder of a Chinese American man mistaken as a Japanese American. And uh, the perpetrators got no um, additional time, uh, jail time and a $3,000 fine because the judge said these aren't the kind of people that you would put in jail. So it sounds familiar with Atlanta shooting. This spawned the a modern wave of Asian American civil rights movement. And in order to coalesce all the different ethnic communities into one, to create a unified political force, they came under this rubric, which was, you know, Asian Pacific American. Now we we use Asian American and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders to be all included. And that's where the term AAPI, Asian American Pacific Islander, comes from. It's partly informed by, you know, the Office of uh, Management and Budget, who defines these categories and they're used for the census. Mm-hmm. Um, but in it, as a community, uh, there have been those of us who have adopted it for the purposes of elevating everyone's voice, because statistically, we're considered insignificant. So we have to unify you know, under this artificial construct, this political identity that is AAPI in order to be heard. And then in turn, once we get the attention of the government to ensure that they're providing us with the programs and services that are reported to everybody, then then we talk about all the unique community needs of those different um, ethnic communities because they they have different immigration histories and, and different languages and, you know, different community needs. What is the best place to find the numbers for the biggest Asian American groups? There is a census mapping tool. It's fascinating because you can you can toggle over the different precinct like jurisdictions over Montgomery County and find which is the leading ethnic group that's most populous among the, the Asian American. Who is this professor? Kartik Ramakrishnan from UC Irvine, founded AAPI Data. A close collaborator is uh, one of our own from University of Maryland, Professor Janelle Wong. Given that immigrants from Asia come from so many different cultures, what brings them together? Yeah, I think it's two prong. And one um, is is born out of unfortunately, community need, which arises most poignantly when the community faces discrimination, you know, such as these hate crime murders, you know, at the most extreme end. Right. And then the, the flip side of that um, is that there are, are community needs that um, the Asian American community would like to bring to the fore to the policymakers, and so they create platforms that are inclusive of all those groups and band together, in, you know, in order to be heard. So it's it's sort of a, a, a flip side of a coin, right? There's a negative yeah. impetus, which unfortunately is the larger driver mm-hmm. of the two, and then there's the positive one. But there's a tension here, right? So the tension is that you want to come together as one, but once you have the recognition, you want to say that, oh, there are differences amongst us and then our needs are very varied. Do you see that tension? Yes, 
that that tension it does exist because you know all the different ethnic groups again they've come to the U.S. at at different waves, um, even from the same country. Mm-hmm. So those immigration waves do characterize how people think, you know, where they're situated along the socioeconomic ladder, their their overall outlook. There's there's also different languages, at least a hundred different languages. And in the case of the Hmong Americans, I don't even think they had a written language until the 1970s. Mm-hmm. You know, um, and in Chinese alone, there's many different dialects. And then there's intergenerational differences too. And so your question is about how to unify them. Well, the question is there's tension between when you unify them, right? You bring them together and then you say, no, but our needs are separate. The government or uh, the broader community doesn't quite know what to do with that. Now, I'll give you a real example of this. With the controversy over the boundary analysis in the county, it seemed that, uh, for example, Indian Americans and uh, Chinese Americans um, came together um, or at least opposed the boundary boundary change together. At the very least, the loudest voices in the room were the ones that were opposing on behalf of both communities. And MCPS, for its analytical purposes, puts whites and Asians together in one group and blacks and Latinos in another creating a dichotomy even though there are subtle differences between the many groups that constitute the Asian American identity and they have different needs. Yeah, so you you draw exactly what um, the challenge is using the the Asian American Pacific Islander rubric, right, which is that people do then tend to think of us as a monolith when in fact we comprise, you know, 50 different ethnic groups. But as I said, that is a political strategy for us to even just be heard, right? And so once the government officials or the other leaders, you know, see us, that's when we we can kind of unpack all the different community needs. There are common platforms that are advanced. Everyone does benefit from certain things. But the reality is, is that these groups do deserve to be seen and heard standing on their own because it is very different. You know, like, for example, Southeast Asian Americans, um, they, contrary to the model minority myth, their high school graduation rates hover around, you know, 50 percent. You know, the um, hepatitis B rates for, you know, the the ethnic Chinese is, is very high. So they're different. They're different issues and they can't be glossed over in service of just, you know, convenience to try to see us as one monolith because we're not, we're diverse. But the challenge still remains. You make the case as a singular category, as a single identity. And then once you have the audience, then you say, oh, there are many, many differences between us. Does that lead to a dissipation of the kind of demands you make? Is Asian American an inherently weak political identity? I don't think that it's a, a weak category. What, what I would like to see is that for people outside the Asian American community uh, do have direct connections with each of the different ethnic communities and see people as people. Mm. Um, but on our side, on the community side, there are challenges in unifying people, but as long as we keep our eye on the ultimate goal, which is to achieve full inclusion or you know, out in, in, in the parlance that's being used now, belonging, and continue to find all the different power levers to get there, whether that's you know, through um, health equity or education equity or representation or anything else, that's what will have to bind us. But I don't think that we need to apologize for the fact that we all have very distinct needs and want to be seen, because ultimately, as individuals, we also want to be seen. We'll be right back. Let's shift gears a little bit. Montgomery County is obviously seen as being different from the Asian American perspective. 
How do you think Montgomery County is different? What is the difference? So M- Montgomery County has 50% of Maryland's immigrants, and it has a very rapidly growing um, concentration of Asian Americans now. It's, it's almost you know, 15%. Mm-hmm. Um, so that is a, a, a critical mass um, in the community, in um, the schools. And as you mentioned, um, that arising out of that have also been some voices that have come out on certain public policy issues. Um, but what I'm saying is that they um, represent like a subgroup of a group, yet on the outside of the major American community, they're you know, seen as representing all of, of, of the Asian American um, community. So I think but that- But Ariane, that's going to happen, right? So um, right. there's never any vacuum in politics. You know, the loudest voices will fill the chamber. At least during the boundary analysis controversy, both the Indian American community and the Chinese American community, at least the loudest parts of those communities, came out against the prospect of any boundary change. And from my perspective, this went against the possibility of bringing together all immigrant groups in the county um, and speaks to a problem of allyship. Yeah, but I guess what I say is that I would ask people to look um, beyond that because I you know I know the dynamics within, I have an understanding of what dynamics are occurring. And so I wouldn't say necessarily characterize that this is the position of the Asian American and South Asian American community because you know the I, I happen to know that there's groups that represent you know there's a certain group that shares a country of origin that came through a specific time window in terms of immigration mm-hmm. you know who shares a certain value but that's like a, a certain set of values on an entire political spectrum so you know it, that doesn't represent for example all Chinese Americans. I'm from the diaspora, you know, the, the Southeast Asia. My husband's from Taiwan. Um, mm-hmm. There's a number of people who are second generation. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we we fell on a different side on that issue. So I, I would push back if um, anyone in the county believes that that is a representation of the Chinese American community, because it's not. And that's my whole point, is that it's diverse. Okay. Um, you set up an organization called uh, Moco Pan, right? That's a, a organization in Montgomery County uh, that brings together progressive Asian Americans uh, together. What is the rationale? So the rationale was that, you know, there are many Asian Americans who are involved in a whole array of issues, but and they also work with national organizations and they live here in the county, not necessarily vocal and organized in the county, which kind of also leads to the misperception that we're a monolith, you know, around certain issues when we do share different, you know, values. Mm -hmm. And so I founded the Montgomery County Progressive Asian American Network in order to bring those voices together and to bundle them so that elevate them so that the county knows. And and I think that it was warranted because even though there are have been, you know, leaders um, who have been active in the last 20 years and people know them, you know, it wasn't until they heard about this organization that I even got a comment um, from a very significant leader in a county who said, oh, I didn't know there were progressive Asian Americans. That's right. That really is the crux of the problem. Of course, there are progressive Asian Americans, but they are not visible in the way that um, non-progressive Asian American groups have been visible, particularly on issues like the boundary uh, analysis. I think the issue, the problem is visibility outside of the community. Yeah, I mean, I can tell you that um, there was a working group that was connected with Impact Silver Spring that was um, comprised of many different community advocates. That was. Can you say what Impact Silver Spring is? Maybe our listeners want to know. So, so Impact Silver Spring is, is an organization in, in Silver Spring, Maryland, and they do a host of really excellent work um, in addition to just bringing people together in order to create communities where they are. 
you know, whether it's their apartment housing complex, whether it's, you know, to address the economic development of downtown Silver Spring, they have um, the Weaver Lab, which brings people around, you know, racial dialogue. And uh, so it's a lot of good work that's headed by Jane Park, who's the executive director and um, their team. That's right. I agree with all that. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, there were there were community advocates who, who came together, like mm-hmm. multiracial group of, of, of folks. And we were concerned with the news reporting of how the MCPS sponsored sessions that ruled out the um, school boundary analyses were deteriorating. We saw that deteriorating into racial divisions. So we had concerns about how that was framed. And we, we took it on upon ourselves to create our own um, meeting, which we invested a lot of time in thinking through, you know, how to create a space where people of different perspectives could speak and then be acknowledged and then um, for there to at least be some listening, right? Mm-hmm. And and in terms of like the Asian Americans being visible, I mean, Jane Park is the executive director of Impact sure. Silver Spring. You know, I, I I was there at the time. I was a, a member of APASAG, Asian Pacific American Student Achievement Action Group, mm-hmm. which is a parent advisory group to MCPS. Paul Tiao, who founded Communities United Hate Against Hate, mm-hmm. was there. So I think it's because of our numbers and also that, um, you know, again, the second generation Asian Americans are involved in so many other issues like, you know, women's rights and environmental justice, you know, and um, and other things that they get diluted into um, other places and they're not necessarily organized around an Asian American identity. Mm -hmm. And for the first generation immigrants, they are just coming of age you know, to, to organize. So, you know, that's why you're, you're kind of seeing, uh, you know, differences in uh, the, the Asian American voices. How are you building alliances between Asian and non-Asian groups? In Montgomery County, I'm really happy to report that, you know, after the George Floyd, that's a George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, there were um, Asian Americans and Black Americans who came together in a group we do consult periodically and born out of that has been for example donations and distributions of masks and and ppes through greg wims and the victim rights fund and he also set up a a a victim's fund when there were uh covid 19 related attacks on asian americans so uh, you know those kind of collaborations are happening here also in the county and around um, the country and something that we need to continue to build upon. You have some recommendations for the Montgomery County government around um, how to prevent hate incidents. Roughly, they were threefold. And one was to improve the public understanding of, of Asian Americans to dispel that model minority myth that we're a monolith of, of wealthy, highly educated elites. And number two is to ask for investment in stronger community outreach to just ensure this flow of communication among the government and nonprofits and community groups. And the the Asian American Liaison Office is the anchor and has done a really good job, but also is, um, you know, a, a single staff to cover a significant diverse array of of community. So what we re- really like to see is a, 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 a landscape study, a directory of all those groups, a survey of they, their needs, an evaluation of their um, participation rates and, and government programs and services. And then the last thing is, is funding to help us create this community infrastructure to build the capacity of nonprofit organizations that are working with communities that are under the, the radar. Okay, shifting gears. An Asian American friend of mine told me that it was very different being an Asian American woman than being an Asian American man. And of course, the people killed in Atlanta were all women. Do you think there are any gender issues here? Absolutely. I think that, that that's true. I mean, I I live that difference every day. <laughs> you know, I, it's, it's like being a double minority, being an Asian American woman, um, you're you're already in the minority as the only often the only Asian American in a room, 
and then in addition to that, you're a woman. So it's very easy for, you know, people to overlook you. I can't tell you how many times, you know, after uh, a speaker panel, I'll go up to try to speak to a speaker, begin a conversation, and some man will come and just cut in because, you, you know, they, they feel like they have that that right, I'm too insignificant, short, invisible, you know, to, to have to wait, you know, their turn. Um, but in this case with the Atlanta shootings, I think there's that extra dimension of also women who are um, immigrants and also in service industry jobs. You know, mm -hmm. they're the vulnerable. I mean, the, the effect of COVID-19 bears, bears this out of all the different racial groups it's the, the Asian American women that have the highest unemployment rates. And that, that's because um, of the numbers that are in these low wage service industry jobs. And so I think what's missing in this whole story about the Atlanta shootings is the intersectionality between you know, race and gender and, and immigrant status and, and also socioeconomic status too. So you mentioned um, that worsening uh, ties between the United States and China has an impact on um, Asian American, the Asian American experience in uh, in in the United States. And it seems that despite the change in administration, that we are headed towards really ro a rocky relationship, a diplomatic relationship. Uh, with China um, and Secretary of State uh, uh, Blinken had very stern words with um, Chinese officials recently. Do you think that has any l sort of impact? I, I put um, issues into different buckets. There's, there's the US-China uh, foreign policy, which is an area that I don't concern myself with because that is in the realm of diplomats and foreign policy officials, national national security officials. Um, but the, the bucket that I am interested in is the US government response and their actions and approaches as they affect um, Americans and particularly sure. Asian Americans in the United States and who have some ties um, to the foreign government but are um, facing adverse employment actions or come under investigation because of stricter scrutiny based on their race, ethnicity, or national origin. So the, to be clear, the, the concerns about the PRC, as far as I can see it, is, is very serious and legitimate. And in no way do advocacy efforts to speak up, um, you know, to call attention to, to what the government's doing that has a collateral damage effect is meant to dilute those national defense approaches at all. That's a completely different conversation. But, but what some of us are saying um, in the advocacy space is that there are, there are framing issues um, that are a problem. There are, for example, like the, there's a, a DOJ um, initiative called the China Initiative, which is focused on, on China economic espionage, but uh, that initiative is not looking at uh, so much about protecting our intellectual property assets, nor is it, you know, looking at all malign actors um, who are foreign governments mm -hmm. who are engaged in economic espionage. So what it does then is it, you know, even if it might be unintentional, frames China, um, you know, amidst everything else that's going on as a boogeyman. You know, and the use of the word China also, it sort of anthropomorphizes that country into the enemy and such that anything related to China, you know, whether that includes Chinese Americans, Chinese owned businesses and so forth, then becomes the enemy. And so then the natural reaction of Americans who already cannot discern the difference between, you know, an Asian and Asian American is they're gonna lash out, which is exactly what's happening in the streets, you know, in the workplaces, you know, you're, you look like the enemy. Um, and so therein is the problem. So that's a framing message. There's also the inflammatory statements, like the previous president said, you know, all Chinese students are spies. 
you know, or kept insisting on using Wuhan virus, you know, to politicize um, an issue to divert attention from the fact he couldn't manage the pandemic in the country. Mm-hmm. You know, there's there's other very unhelpful statements like, you know, our PTAs are being infiltrated by the PRC, you know, by our, sec- our former Secretary of State. So th- those are, and then our candidates too, you know, um, were there were candidates in Texas, there was a state ballot initiative by energy companies, you know, who showed these campaign ads with visuals like marching red armies, all extremely unhelpful, you know, to ensuring the safety of, of Asian Americans, particularly at a time where the FBI was warning against the surge of hate crimes because of this conflation. Well, I hope things get better and the uh, Atlanta killings are investigated and prosecuted properly and that you'll come back when the news is better. Thank you, Sunil. What lessons should we draw from my conversation with Ariane Young? First, Asian American is an American political identity forged in the heat of American politics. Immigrants from Asia do not come here thinking of themselves as Asian, but their numbers and the discrimination and the racism they experience helps bind together the Asian identity, especially when incidents of violence occur. Second, under the large umbrella of the Asian American identity, there are several cultural and ethnic groups, as well as socioeconomic and ideological divisions. The challenge of creating a unified Asian American identity is continuously contested by these differences and the tension between being a singular group and the divisions that run between the subgroups does dissipate collective action. In the absence of clear threats, Asian groups focus internally on cultural and perhaps faith issues. Third, Montgomery County is different. With almost 15% of the population counting themselves as Asian, political leaders and County officials are solicitous of Asian American views and respectful of the community. But as Ariani on cautions, the county should not take its record for granted and continue to build out the infrastructure that would provide resilience if something awful were to happen. Lastly, though it may seem that progressive voices are missing from the Asian American community, especially in Montgomery County, this is because many Asian Progressives are engaged in broader political projects at the national level and may be distracted from more local issues such as school boundaries. But when the community is threatened, progressive Asian voices do reassert leadership. And Ariane Ong herself, as well as Jane Park of Impact Silver Spring, and others are shining examples. I'll be back with Andrew Sandri and his upcoming report. Hey, Andrew, how are things up county? Hi, Sunil. Great. Thanks for asking. This week, I looked at the differences between cost of living expenses in the up and down county. I'll save you some of the numbers that I crunched, but to be expected, housing in up county is much cheaper than down county and tends to consume a far smaller percentage of up county residents' incomes. Also, these homes tend to be newer on average than their down county counterparts, and newer homes are generally larger than older homes. Uh, This is perhaps the single biggest reason, the the affordability of housing, uh, for the rapid growth in population up county. The demand has subsequently been met by more housing development up up here, which of course means more traffic and more demand for for transit infrastructure. Uh, Also, expectedly, transportation costs in the up county were several hundred dollars more a year uh, than they are down county. At the same time, transit ridership is about 10% less up county than it is down county and the average vehicle miles traveled per year is about 6,000 miles more up county than down. Wow, that's a lot of difference. On balance, which part of the county is cheaper to live? Generally, up county. Uh, The increased cost of buying and maintaining a car, which averaged out in the data to about $300 a year, uh, are outweighed by the difference in housing costs. It's like $4,000, a little less than $4,000 more a year to live down county. 
Uh, but it really depends on a lot of different factors like where your job is, how much that job pays, how accessible your house and office are to car versus public transit. Uh, one thing that wasn't really a factor that I found was gas prices, which are actually pretty similar up and down county. So what about the rest of the county? So the divide between up and down county pales in comparison to the divide between east and west county. Also, the poverty rate in East County is about double what it is in the West County. Rent and mortgages are thousands of dollars more a year in the West County, but the average income uh, in the East is just barely over half of what it is in the West, uh, which isn't surprising if you know Montgomery County because the wealthier residents uh, of uh, the West County tend to have more discretionary spending. This East-West divide is more apparent down county in mid and in the mid-county uh, but it does persist in the up county. There's a notable difference in the average household income uh, between the Poolsville, Darnstown, Barnesville area and the Montgomery Village, Damascus area. What does this mean for local politics? Well, first it tells you where political power lies. As anyone who's lived here for longer than 15 minutes will tell you, the down county and the west county are a lot more powerful than the up county and the east county. The residents of the, the down county and the west county uh, tend to be more inclined to be super volunteers. They tend to spend a lot more money on campaigns, which is something uh, that Adam Pignuco of the Maryland blog Seventh State uh, profiled recently. Uh, second, their political priorities differ. Transportation has got to be the biggest issue in the up county, while down county, a lot of the debate is around affordable housing. Uh, third, residents of the up county and east county tend to feel more removed from political organizations and institutions, uh, pushing candidates to cater to them less. And sort of this, this vicious cycle in the you know, primaries and whatnot. And it leads residents to vote for things like nine districts. Uh, but the nine districts referendum lost. True and I was opposed to it, uh, but the campaign for nine districts did make its presence felt to the ballot box. And the feelings that, the, the very valid feelings uh, that fueled it remain driving forces behind organizing up here. So tell me, why were you opposed? I think the general sentiment behind the nine districts campaign was right. Uh, but getting rid of the at-large members and replacing them with exclusively single member districts I don't think would have expanded our power up here. As individuals, we would have fewer elected officials who represent us and collectively as an up county community, we would have been relegated to a permanent major minority on the county council because of the way that the population is, is spread out. Uh, the ballot initiative that I did support, however, which ended up winning, added two seats to the county council. It was a, a compromise measure uh, that I think actually will increase collective representation without taking away from our individual representation. Well, we will be talking about redistricting in depth in a future uh, <laughs> episode. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Sunil. I want to thank the guys at Ed's Not Dead Podcast for pointing me to this journey into podcasting and AJ Campbell for early help, including making the logo art. Our music comes from the local band Soul Witness. I'm very much looking forward to showcasing local talent and especially local music students on the podcast. If you want to share your music on the show or know someone who might want to do it, please email us at ihppod at gmail.com or reach out on Twitter at ihppod. I hope you will subscribe and share the podcast as we bring you stories about politics close to you and your home. See you next time.